Okay, let's get officially get started one more time here. Um, so, I am going to work backwards from the lecture that I started uh, last week. And the lecture I started last week was on VRML. We downloaded it, we took a look at some examples. Hard to do very much with it until we have the foundational stuff. So I'm going to go through the foundational stuff today. But I also want to point out a few additions that I made to the website uh, between uh, yeah, last week and this week. And, uh, and to also show you where this lecture is located. If you go into the website, uh, the bhacker.com website, you go into computer graphics, and you scroll down to the lectures category, click on lectures, and the one that I'm going over today is way towards the bottom. It's called 3D modeling, and this is actually number two. I'm going to work backwards to number one because uh, I started in this direction. So we actually covered part of number two. So it's 3D modeling, too, uh, which we're going to finish up today. And uh, just to give you a little bit of insight here on what I added, if you go back to the course materials, actually go back to up to the main, main directory here. I put in this one here a beginner's guide to VRML, uh, which is not a bad site to kind of go through and read, actually, because you'll have to create some... Uh, some VRML assignments for this course. Uh, and this is what we're going to be talking about today, the 3D graphic plane, XYZ stuff, um, the geometry part of it. Um, if you go through this website, it's really nice, actually, in terms of um, explanations and examples. And uh, the other link that I put up, actually there's three of them total, the um, free VRML book, which is a PDF file, uh, which is from VRML 97, but it's current, actually. Um, it's about 300 pages. It's a PDF book, um, which is, we don't really have a book for this course, so I'm putting up all these extra resources for you. And uh, the third one is a VRM tutorial example, which is this file here. If I open it up, this is the one that I put together. If I open the file up, what we're going to get are all the links. So the Cosmo, so if you missed last week's class and you want the Cosmo player or if you want any of the step-by-step uh, -step tutorial, um, all those links that I was showing you through the web browser last week, I put them into a Word file and I put that up on the site as well. So this is all the resources that you're going to hopefully find handy for the VRML. So um, any one of them, I mean you're probably not going to read it all, what you're going to do is hopefully use this for searching for answering questions and solving problems when you run into it um, in terms of trying to create those assignments. So I believe next week we'll probably start writing some VRML code. I want to get through some more basic stuff before, some shape information, some polygon concepts uh, before I go that far, uh, just so that we're all on the same page uh, in terms of the background information. So understanding the 3D scene, the world concept, modeling, in terms of the geometry, appearance, behaviors, rendering on the display, that's the topics for today. Understanding delivering interactive animation, 3D. Uh, and then also looking at uh, the OpenGL and the VRML, which we've actually already hit um, in terms of an introduction, but we'll take and put that together. So the lecture is actually called modeling because it gets into the modeling concept and the modeling concept is uh, representing objects in a 3D dimensional plane, um, which is what uh, the focus of what we're doing here. Um, what we're looking at is a 2D project. Actually, you're looking at a 2D image right now. So the, the constant battle is taking and creating a 3D scene on a 2D display, uh, two dimensional display. So when we talk about viewing, that's when we're projecting it and we're creating viewing angles and creating the viewing concept on the 2D display. Um, the rendering concept is the illumination, the shading, adding realism, textures, shadows, and all of these different things that we can actually add with VRML. So VRML does the same thing as OpenGL. It's just a little higher level API if you missed the last class. Um, and it's the one that we're going to use for this particular course. So these are the basic concepts I'm going to basically uh, go over today, talk about today with you. So here it is. I've been talking about it, but here it is. This is the XYZ plane, which gives us 3D. X and Y gives us 2D. So our 3D plane, basic geometry. Um, the objects that are represented as a set of faces. So we have polygons. We usually refer to them as polygons. And then faces as a set of points that establish the face. 
so this is actually kind of a classic example of you know this little this cube rectangle kind of thing over here where, where we see one face two face actually we see all the faces because it's a tran translucent um, box but um, we coordinate it we create this in the plane and then our faces are what's pointing to us in the viewing angle so we set the view to particular faces to particular angles which gives us, you know, above and beyond the concept of rotating it, uh, gives us the, the view in terms of the viewing plane. It gives us our scene. So our scene is an example. Scenes are composed of by scaling, rotating, and translating objects created in the 3D world. So the scene, by definition, is just throwing all that stuff out there and putting it into the world. And the world is our space or our view that we're basically using. Um, so here's our scene here with the 3D sh three shapes. So your first assignment is going to be creating a uh, spaceship. What you're really doing is creating a scene with multiple objects that you're going to put together. Whether you overlap them in the same XYZ coordinate or you put them in different coordinations, uh, coordinate scales, um, locations, and then have them connect somehow, which is essentially the concept that you're supposed to get out of the first assignment. And if you haven't started working on that yet, you might you start thinking about your concepts in terms of what it is you want to look at um, and then start going through some of the examples on the VRLM sites and you'll see it's not that hard of an assignment. So, so viewing. Here is uh, our camera and we're looking at something in our viewing angle. Uh, so the concept of clipping. So we select a volume of interest uh, in terms of the projection and then we have a 3D scene that's projected onto the 2D plane which gives us our clipping or our viewing which means we don't have to render anything else that's not visible. So we have things that, you know, get rid of back faces, front faces, depending upon rotation, depending upon viewing angle. Um, because all this stuff here, if you remember, has to go through rendering pipeline, rendering pipeline is processing. And so we want to limit the amount of processing we actually have to perform. In doing so, we can basically con create a clipping concept. The clipping is essentially scaling the image so that we're only seeing the faces that uh, we're looking at rendering. So in the concept of rendering, we're primarily interested in illumination. So how is the light reflected from the surfaces? Which is, would be the answering the question, well, how, is things, how are things illuminated? And then shading. How do we use the knowledge of illumination to shade surfaces in the world to create the shading concept? Uh, in terms of rendering, we also have the texture and the shadows to consider. And so we create the objects, we put them out onto the, in the world, then we cast, we do shading, we do lighting, and we, all these are external components. So just take the entire world and break it out into a million pieces, and then you're adding selective pieces as to what you want to show in, in the particular scene that you're creating. And so on the internet we have the VRM, VRML, which is where this comes into place. It's ISO standard, gives us the 3D graphics, compatible with the internet, works over um, HTTP protocol and an HTML browser, and as we saw last week, there's also separate viewers that you can download and look at. It allows the modeling of geometry, the appearance of the behavior. So let's talk about rendering for a few. Um, in terms of advanced rendering, well, it's not really advanced. It's just more concepts that are associated with it. We have the direct versus the global illumination models. So to illuminate, we might have to end up shutting that door eventually, but let's see. Uh, so there seems to be a lot of traffic. TA? Maybe we can have that door shut. Yeah. There seems to be a lot of traffic going up and down that hallway. So, <laughs> um, so let's see. Uh, in the concept of what would be considered advanced or applied, let's maybe call it applied rendering, direct versus global illumination methods, ray tracing, which is definitely an advanced concept, and then uh, radiosity. Um, so other advanced features might include curve and surface modeling image-based rendering and non-photorealistic uh, rendering. So advanced rendering, let's take a look at the concept of global illumination. Um, and then, so in terms of ray tracing, what we have is like the human eye over here. And then we're looking at the scene. And then we have a light source. And the light source is projecting a light image. And we have directional light pinpointed lights, ambient light. We have all sorts of different types of lighting that we could apply towards the scene. But it's essentially casting the light onto many objects that are in the scene. This would be a global illumination concept. 
where we have uh, everything is affected by it. It's almost like, you know, the Earth. You know, when the sun comes up in the morning, that's a global <laughs> illumination. Uh, or a room, when you turn on the lights, and the overhead lights in a room, looking at illumination in terms of a global. Uh, radiosity is based on the physics of the radioactive heat transfer between the surfaces. We can calculate that, and obviously we can't sense heat. can't even sense location in an artificial computer graphics environment. But we can make calculations and use algorithms to mimic it, to project where the, you know, where the heat surfaces might be in terms of a physiological kind of explanation for that. So it's all mathematical based. So we have the 3D coordinate system, and we have the left and the right points here. So the Z points away, and the Z points towards us gives us our positioning. So depending upon where the Z is located, we're going to have our left, our right, our center, our viewpoint. So we position the, the, the scene itself in terms of the coordinate system. And rotation and movement and animation and everything is just basically a, a matrix calculation to take those coordinates from whatever object we've, we've put out there, we've placed out there, and then rotate the object within the coordinate system. And then that's actually referred to the concept of, as part of the concept of transformation. When we transform the image from one position to another, it gives us animation, it also gives us the view. And then if we have that, and if it's down into an algorithm that's applied automatically for us, when we cast a light out there, the light changes with the object. So the light that was on one part of the object is now on another part of the object when the object moves or rotates. And if you take a look at some of those lighting examples um, that are out there on some of the websites that I've given you, um, you'll see how the different lights actually affect. And you can rotate the objects in the scene and the light actually moves. And the light is interactive with it. That's purely, that's, that's simply 3D. Uh, in terms of the essence. A, a 2D image, if you move the image around, the light's on the image. So it's not a world concept, it's static. So the light, if something was illuminated, well that just is going to move. You're just changing the angle of something versus actually rotating an object. So the uh, line the thumb with the x-axis and the first... Uh, so if you take the, the thumb, put it on the x-axis, and then the first finger is the y-axis, and then the second finger here, uh, which is our appropriate hand, gives you the, the Z axis. You can actually create the scene with your fingers, actually. Um, and then you can rotate around, actually, to kind of see. So this, was, this would be the right angle. So we have the Z facing away from us, or excuse me, the Z points towards us is going to give us the right, the Z points away from us is going to give us the left angle. So. Uh, so it's common now to use the right-handed system in terms of the right angle, so as an opening scene. So points and vectors. So you should write <coughs> points as a column vector. So the point is going to be an x, y, z, and we take the point and we put it out here. So we draw shapes this way. If you're using OpenGL, this is what you're doing. You're actually specifying the points. And then we have the difference of the two points. It gives us our directional vector to the right, to the left, up, down, is going to be a calculation on taking this coordinate of points and subtracting it with another coordinate of points. And then we have the amount of rotation that we're applying, which is um, sort of the simplified way of actually providing the transformation. So here we have point one and point two. Over here, the difference is the, the minus, which is going to give us our, our object space. In between. So note that P1 and P2 are on a plane, then D lies in the plane. Because the, the D is going to be the difference between the two points, so it's going to be within the plane. So it's going to be within our view in terms of our um, object definition. Then we have the polygonal representation. So the points is the lowest level of detail that we're going to be able to put out there in terms of plotting uh, an image or a scene. Then we work up a little bit higher and we go into the polygonal um, representation. And if we go up a little bit higher than that, then we go into the shape representation and then we have VRML. So the point level here, we can take from an OpenGL perspective. From this one, we're looking at a higher level API just from the beginning. And then uh, we take this a little bit further, then we're looking at VRML. So what I did is I picked something that was actually kind of easy for you 
to work with from a programming perspective, but it's nice to know the underlying concepts in terms of what it is we're trying to accomplish. So any 3D object can be represented as a set, a set of plane polygonal surfaces. So we take this rectangle and we take all these surfaces here. So you note that each vertex part has several different polygons that are associated with it. And so we're really composing this shape with all of these different pieces, which is the building blocks of what you're using when you create shapes. And so you can connect the shapes together. You can actually create your own rectangle as an example, your own square, um, which is how you're going to essentially create your own uh, spaceship or flying saucer or whatever, UFO, whatever it is that you're creating. So objects with uh, curved surfaces can be approximated by polygons as well. So it's not just for flat surfaces or squared. Uh, so improve approximation by uh, having many different polygons. That, as I was mentioning before, the higher number of polygons, the more level of detail that you actually have in the image, and uh, more surface mapping you can do, and the more real the uh, the image is actually going to be represented. So, so here's our little uh, way of dissecting it out in terms of non um, not uh, curved surfaces, non straight surfaces. And then we have our scene organization. So we have the scene, which is the list of objects. And then we have the object, which is a list of surfaces. And then the surface, which is a list of polygons. And then the polygon, which is a, basically a list of vertices. So bringing it all down to the point level. So if we take this scene here that has the object and we dissect it out, what we're still looking at is the points, the vertices uh, that are representing the individual shape that is representing the polygon representation, which is giving us our surfaces and again our objects. So it doesn't really matter what level of detail you're working at. You have more flexibility if you're down here. If you're working with an open GL, you're working on this level. And this level is combined for you automatically to create common shapes. So in VRML, we create shapes. So we put those shapes together with other shapes and provide different things uh, for them, which gives us a more realism more realism and it's an easier API to sort of work with. So here's our polygonal data, data structure in terms of the number of vertices. So we take our, vert these are all of the vertices that we have if we break it down into our list of vertices in this particular abstraction. And here's for object number one, we put the vertices together, we have our object table, we have our polygon table, and we have our vertex table. So if we keep all of the data that's associated with the shape representation separate, then we can render it through the pipeline more efficiently, which is why it's done this way. So if we have a back surface, we don't necessarily have to show it. If we know it's in the back, we can look at our polygonal table, and we go, well, these are the vertices that are hidden. So we can do a hidden view, you know, eliminate those views. So when we're rendering, we're going to render the front. We're going to render what's visible. Then when we rotate, then we're going to render what's now visible <laughs> from the change. So we can ca take and calculate the coordinate system, put it into a table, look up in the table, and the, basically our algorithms are, are, that are designed to do the rendering are looking up in the table. What surface is going to be there? And it paints it while it's rotating. It makes absolutely no sense to send all of this data through the pipeline and have it appear on the screen takes too long, it's too slow. And imagine a fast video game or something that's doing a real-time animation, a real-time movement. Not possible. And even if it were possible, why would we want to? Because what if something changes? Then we can adapt for changes as well. Because this is a dynamic environment. Actually, it's not stationary. And because of, of the dynamic nature of it, we could cast uh, light, you know, that's coming from a different dir a direction or angle onto the object, and then the light's going to illuminate the object differently, depending upon the type of light. And so we can't, if we pre-render everything and stick it out there, we can't transform it. It doesn't lend, lend itself very well to transformation. So typical primitives. Um, so graphical systems such as OpenGL typically support triangles, triangle strips, and fans, quads, quad strips, and polygons. VRML also supports these as well. You can, you can create shapes of this level and put them together. So uh, which way is front? Well, that's a good question. So when we take a picture, we know where the front of the picture is, and we know where the backs and the sides. When we create the polygons, we put them together in terms of the 3D plane. 
we don't know which way is the right. So you, you can go by default and say, well, zero, z is equal to zero. Then you're looking at it from a particular x, y. You're looking at essentially from a 2D plane. So most of your VRML viewers will put z at zero. And you'll have the x, y. And you'll be looking actually at the back or the front, depending upon the default settings. And um, that's going to define your front for you. So a conventional is that the normal points towards you if the vertices are specified counterclockwise. So, and then the normal is going to be our normal position or starting position uh, where we're going to set some default coordinates. So everything starts at a particular point and then it rotates around. We have to have a starting place. So it's usually referred to as the normal. So modeling regular objects here. Uh, we have a sweeping, spinning, sweep axis in terms of what we're doing in a 2D plane versus a spinning axis. So these are the certain things that we can do to particular shapes. We can actually spin a, we don't have to spin a cylinder, we can actually spin something else. Um, but they're the objects themselves in terms of their definition. So a 2D profile here uh, is going to look like, you know, a, a dot. If we have a sweeping axis, it's going to look this, it's going to look elongated versus actually put into a, a combination with a bunch of other vertices to create a shape. In terms of the spinning, we have, uh, you know, rendering one, rendering two in terms of the different angles that we can look at to apply towards it. So we can have a spinning axis in that particular case. So sweeping a cycle to generate a cylinder of polygons. And this is basically just describing, and you don't actually have to know because we don't have to do this from an open GL. So a lot of this is um, more applicable to a lower level API such as open GL. So we don't necessarily have to work with any of these components um, because this is what's given for you. But if we take the algorithm approach to do a sweeping in terms of the style of shape formation, what we'd be looking at is all the vertices locations and then the center points of the vertices and then applying a sweep for the lines to create that cylinder. So what we're trying to do is create this shape in terms of the, the concept. So then we have complex uh, primitives. So actually the primitives that are in VRML are pretty primitive and uh, are actually are pretty complex. Uh, OpenGL has lower level primitives. So some systems such as VRML have cylinders, cones, those are called primitives. Polygon representations calculated automatically for you. So we just say give me a cone, give me a sphere, give me a this, and it's calculated for you and the shape itself in terms of its definitions already created, which is why we're using it. In other languages like OpenGL, we can use a utility library that contains various different high level primitives against con again converted to polygons. So we're looking at lines, points, polygons that we're putting together. Conventional graphics, uh, polygons rule. Well, polygons are essentially what you're looking at in conventional graphics. All graphic packages are going to work at the polygon level, essentially. So then we have the automatic generation of polygonal objects. That the graphic library should do for you uh, because we're looking at putting polygons together to create detail in terms of the shape. So 3D scanners or laser rangers or able to generate computer representations of objects. So we scan an image and it should convert it to polygonal kind of structure. A lot of them actually do in concept um, to make corrections and also to for editing purposes. Objects sit on a rotating table. They, so the contour outline generated for a given height. Scanner moves them from levels to the next contour created. And uh, the scanning system essentially is doing a 3D interpretation of a 2D model by moving it. So the successive contour stretches between the given polygon representation and creates the abstraction. So here's an interesting puzzle is, uh, you know, do you make the person, and this is basically looking at the object in relationship with the other objects. So in terms of what's going on in this particular picture, the room looks small. If you look at the size of this object, Excuse me, the room looks big. <laughs> Over here, the room looks rather small. If you make this object bigger, and just stick her in here, and now she's no, no room for the balloons anymore. She's now touching the ceiling. So you're providing this as curtains in the background. This one has slightly different, no image in the background, so slightly different representation. So. 
gives you an area in terms of uh, positioning of models, excuse me, positioning of objects. So it's the object positioning that's giving you the illusion of something being large or small or something being to the left or to the right, and it's the orientation within the plane. So if we made the building bigger, then the girl wouldn't look so, so big. Or is it that she looks bigger? It probably is compared to the building. The two windows are the same size, however. Well, one of them is a little bit bigger, I think. So. It's modeling objects and creating worlds. This would be an example of a world. It's a world scene. So you've seen how boundary representations of single objects can be created. The boundary representation is giving us our height in relationship with other objects. So the boundary of where something is stopping and another object is beginning. You don't actually have to worry about that with your uh, spaceship, but you probably could. In terms of boundary representation, that's how we took a circle. If you remember that example I gave you like last week or the week before, there was a circle inside of the same position in the plane. And there was a circle and then there was a square and the, they overlapped each other, but because of the contour of the circle, the sides bubbled out, gave us an interesting shape. That's a concept of boundary. The representation of the square stopped in a circle. Boundary was a different shape. So the representation of that gave us a completely interesting, different kind of concept. Here we're taking this object and we're putting it into a relationship with an, a bigger object or a smaller object. We're going to get an effect. I mean, in fact, we could really make this interesting by having her cut off, make her a little bit bigger. It should be through the roof. So, then it might create a, yet another different type of scene orientation. So, Typically, each object is created in its own coordinate system. It is every single object that you're going to create um, and you'll see this when you start creating because you have to create one object before you can create another before you can create another so each object that you're going to create and or component piece of an object is in its own coordinate system and you put them together in terms of the transformation so that they all move together so you group objects together to create similar and this is what you're going to see with the robot or the humanoid in one of the assignments so you're grouping a bunch of boxes or cones or something together to form an arm as a concept. And you're forming the concept by grouping and by creating. But each one of those separate objects is in a separate coordinate system. So to create a world, you need to understand how to transform objects so as to place them into the right place. Transform translation at the right size, scale, in the right orientation, and for the right, orient for, for right rotation. If we rotated these objects, we'd, have, we'd rotate the person object differently than we would the building object, which we probably wouldn't want to rotate unless we want to turn the building upside down. Which brings us to the concept of transformations. And now the simplest way to remember this is just taking the coordinate x, y, z and adding a number to each one of them, or subtracting a number to each other. Or taking a starting and an ending location and rotating the object from point A to point B. And then you get animation that comes out of transformation. So basic linear transformations are, we have a translation, a scaling, and then a rotation. Uh, so this is your terminology for today. So your, the P is equal to P plus T, where T is the translation vector. That says we're going to move an object, we're going to translate it from this position to this position, and we've rotated it by translating the matrix. So this is the only math you actually have to kind of conceptualize for this course, is being able to take, in this particular case, if P is a point, we're taking one point, or one picture, one, one, one object from an XYZ location and moving it to another XYZ location by adding some calculation to it to translate it. We translate it evenly. So we move it all to the left by two, or to the right by two. That's what you get automatically when you bring up that viewer and you put your mouse in there and you start moving it. It's going by the number of moves your mouse dragged. So, or you get the same thing in one of the yeah, browser um, plugins as well. So to scale it is where we apply S times P, where S is the scaling matrix. So we can scale, make it smaller, make it bigger. This is a scale. This is a scaling transformation. Although the position is different, so it's not very realistic. If she were the same person and not a different image, a different object image, then we could scale her bigger or smaller. 
Of course, the balloons wouldn't fit. So, And then rotation itself, where we have the rotational um, degree or the rotational metrics that's added. So, excuse me, multiplied by the position itself. So we rotate it to the left or to the right some amount. Um, in terms of the translation, we're moving it, but we may not necessarily be rotating it. It might be a hop from one position to another. Usually we would translate to project out the initial scene. We translate it so that this is sitting on top of this. We have a chair that's in front of a table, and we have a lamp that's on the, it would be a translation kind of thing um, in terms of the coordinates. So as in 2D graphics, we use a homogeneous co coordinate system in order to express all transformations as metrics and allow them to be combined easily. So in a homogeneous coordinate system, we have the coordinate system of a 3D point where we have X, Y, and Z where it rec recognizes our 3D point instead of our two-dimensional point, which would be an X and a Y. It represents as X, Y, Z 1 for our translation. So this is a point this is a point in a 4D space with its extra coordinate equal to 1. So now I've gone from 3D to 4D, but we've applied a translation to it. Um, so note in the heterohomogeneous hetero uh, coordinate system, the multiplication by a constant leaves the point unchanged. Actually, well, it just moves it, but it leaves the, the positioning to a different location, but it's still the same points still the same size, still the same characteristics that are associated with it. It just moves it. Um, so if we take it and we multiply it by the same thing, we haven't really done very much to it. It's changing the point system, translating it to move it. So here's our translation as a concept, which isn't, uh, this isn't too bad. So suppose we want to translate P, X, Y, Z, T to a different translation by a distance, and here's our distance, then we express it in this particular form is a translation matrix that's shown below here and translate P. So P is going to be equal to this positioning system by the offset, which is going to be equal to the final position. So we take it for granted, but uh, VRML does it for us automatically. So they're going to do the translation for us. We can also do this ourselves to move the object without the, uh, put it on a timer or put it in a button click so that the object moves without us having to actually manually move it with a mouse and then we create animation from the scene. So we can have something that bounces, a ball that bounces, or we can have, um, I don't know, clouds that move in the sky or something like that. And all we're doing is rotating, translating the image from one section of the screen and then it comes back around and, and loop it. So this is where OpenGL comes with that state machine loop concept. Because if we de de define the translation and we put it in the main loop, then we have automatically this three-dimensional object floating with a fish swimming. Actually, we saw fish swimming in VRML. Very similar concept. Actually, implemented the same way. Scaling. So here's our scaling by, and we're taking the same constant s and we're just multiplying it. So relative to the origin. So we have s times p, and we're ending up with our our final version of the uh, translated scaling. Make something bigger, make something smaller. Um, so scaling is different from translation. This translation moves, translates it, but keeps it the same. So, and then scaling makes it smaller, makes it bigger, keeps it the same coordinate system. We're just making the size of the point. So the, in terms of the coordinate system, making it larger, Expen extending it out. And then our rotation, our rotation specific, specified by in respect for the axis. When we rotate around the axis, we take the x and y and move it around the z. So if you imagine a pole and you have x and a y around it, z stays the same, we just rotate it this way. <laughs> then we can put a cone out there. Z's coming down the center of the cone, and we rotate it around, we put it in a loop, and then we have a spinning cone, spinning top. Um, or we have the object C that's rotated. That's really what's referred to as rotation. Translation is taking a cone here and moving it up this way. We're moving it over here. We're translating it into a different coordinate system. A rotation is just taking it and a spinning, uh, rotating it at the same coordinate Z location, but moving the X's and the Y's all over the place. So. Rotating it around the X axis in this point, you can rotate it clockwise or counterclockwise, depending upon which axis you choose. 
we rotate about the x-axis, we're looking at the uh, p times the rotation uh, scale, or, excuse me, percentage that we're going to actually rotate it by, uh, or did, and then we're coming out with our final positioning. So a positive angle corresponds to the counterclockwise direction, looking at the origin from a positive perspective. Negative is going to be a left instead of a right. So depends on which direction we're going in, in terms of the rotation. Then we have composite transformations. So the attraction of the homogeneous coordinate system that is a sequence of transformations may be encapsulated into a single matrix. So we're combining it together to rotate a grouping of object shapes. So for example, scaling with respect to a fixed position, A, B, and C, can be achieved by translating the points to the origin, scaling it, and then translating it back to from a fixed point back into a starting positional point. So we have the makings of um, animation in terms of uh, rotation, composite items achieved by transformation. So. Rotation about a specified axis. So this will be able to rotate about any axis in the 3D plane, uh, which is kind of like what I was describing in terms of uh, going around a Z. Uh, so it's achieved by compo composing seven elementary transformations. So here's our rotation. So, so the initial position, let's say, is here, translating it to the origin. So the, you know, where XYZ is going to intercept. If we sort the origin at zero, that's normally the normal. When, we, when you hear to it, you know, in terms of the normal, it's usually with the uh, origin set. The position is, this is the normal position, by the way. Um, it doesn't have to be, but uh, it's defined mostly by default. Um, you get that when you get, you can tell what the normal positioning is, is when you bring up the viewer and you see the object. And it's flat, because it's at the origin. And then you move it around, and then all of a sudden it starts looking like it's three-dimensional. Uh, so you rotate so that the uh, P1 lies on the Z-axis, two rotations over here. You have a rotation through the another angle. And so you can kind of see how the rotational um, areas kind of specified by the axis can actually kind of change the uh, positioning. It's just giving us our viewpoints, by the way. This is all about viewpoint. The item doesn't actually exist. <laughs> Which is kind of interesting, because after you get done with all those, where is the item? It doesn't matter. That's what gives us our 3D kind of definition, is how we're going to view it in terms of its coordinate system. Then we have the inverse transformation. I'll turn it inside out. I'll turn it back. Turn it back or forward. So, as in this example, it's often useful to calculate the inverse of the transformation. The transformation returns to the or original state. Bring it back to the uh, original. So we have the translation, the scaling, rotation all apply towards it, but you're going in a negative direction to bring it back to the inverse. So, so what I just gave you was uh, sort of the concepts associated with transformation, and they all work together with projections and viewing. So I'm going to kind of move forward a little bit. Um, so in terms of viewing, and uh, so all of these concepts actually work together. So don't think of them as separate components. So we have the display devices that are 2D, the rectangular screens. Uh, everyone's familiar with that, I hope, because you all have computer screens in front of you. Those are 2D devices, by the way. So you need to understand how to transform a 3D world into a 2D space. This is where it all comes into place. It involves selecting the observer position or the camera position, selecting the view plane or the, cam or the camera film plane, and then selecting the type of projection. Um, and basically, the way I describe this is uh, if you were to use your eyes as the camera <laughs> and you walk into a room, actually your viewpoints right now are different than my <coughs> viewpoints because I'm standing up, so I'm probably a little bit higher up in the plane. In my camera position, if my eyes were my cameras and I'm looking forward, I'm not seeing too much of a shadow of anything because i got the illumination of the lights. But I see the scene this way. Your viewpoints, you're sitting down and you're looking forward in the opposite direction that I'm looking. Your viewpoint's different. So you're defining this for your scene so that when your scene opens up, kind of like making a movie actually, you have your viewpoint. Your viewpoint's going to define where the objects are in the 3D plane. Because if we were in a 3D plane, your positions are different than mine. 
In fact, I'm the inverse uh, on one angle. So, and each one of you actually is in a s separate position. So, if we were to create a real world here, we could move you around by clicking on you. <laughs> we'll put you in a computer animation here. And it, use the separate objects would change. You trans, you would transform into different locations, and then we could take the whole scene and rotate you around. We can apply a light to. You. Uh, we can change your viewing angle individually. This is where the realism comes into place. Because if you create an object, for example, if you had my viewing angle and you're sitting over there, the scene would open up and you'd be backwards. Because you're seeing, you'd have to turn the scene around to match your viewing angle correctly. Because if you had my scene and I had your scene, we switched them, it would be confusing. In fact, the scene would make absolutely no sense. So this actually happens sometimes. In fact, um, last week when I showed you the example of the, the fish tank with the, uh, the swimming fish, and we turned it upside down so that the water was on the ceiling and the, the, the air. Confusing. You're looking at the, what is that? And I was like, well, this, the water is now above us. That's the viewing angle. Where the orientation is set so that the bottom is on the top. It's flipped. And the top is on the bottom. So it doesn't mean you can't do that. What if you were flying an airplane? In fact, this is a nice little simulation, actually. Create a VRML model of an airplane and then turn the airplane upside down. Well, you'd want the scene, and that's the viewing angle that's being changed. So all you're doing is you're rotating the view, or you're changing the view, making it, the perspective the different. Um, which kind of borderlines with photography, that kind of borderlines with movies. So the entire concepts all work the same way. It's the same thing you get in computer graphics as well. So digital arts people can um, can conceptualize cameras. Computer science people, we think about eyes. <laughs> my eyes on the camera. So what am I doing? Well, that's my viewing angle. Up, down, left, right. I'm changing my angle by moving my head. So, uh, so anyway, it doesn't really matter how you uh, see it. It's all the same concept. So there's two types of projections. We have the perspective and the parallel. And this is simplified for computer graphics. You can probably get into a lot more in the real world and other, other sciences associated with uh, uh, cameras, I should say. So in the perspective projection, object positions are projected into the view plane along lines with they converge at the observer. So it's from the perspective of the observer, and the observer is the camera. So here's our view plane. And uh, we're going to see certain things depending upon the type of uh, projection. We're actually going to apply whether it's going to be a parallel or it's going to be a perspective. So this one here, on uh, the observer, from the perspective of the observer, which takes into orientation overlapping images. So as an example, if I were to define my perspective projection of what I'm looking at right now, I see you sitting there, right? I don't see her computer. I see the tip of her computer, which means in my viewing plane, the person sitting behind you, it's all gone, except for a little bit of her head <laughs> and this right end of her computer. It's not a parallel, so I'm seeing it from this way out, which is how we normally see things. It's how humans, human perception actually picks things up because it's hidden, which means I shouldn't see the back of her computer and I shouldn't see what's in front of her. Versus a parallel projection. So a parallel projection the observer position is at an infinite distance. So the projection lines are parallel. So instead of it being, the projection lines here are scaled, depending upon what I'm seeing. I'm seeing narrow to larger. So now I have parallel in the view plane. Now, so we have some examples of this coming up, actually. So we have, uh, it's at the same angle but it's uh, giving us a slightly different view of the view plane. So instead of it being scaled, it's parallel. So. so parallel projection preserves the relative positions of objects but does not give a realistic, realistic view. So this is more realistic perspective. This is what we see as humans. We don't see this as humans. This is parallel. But it gives us more information in a 2D world, it gives us more detail that we'd normally not, not see. And I guess some examples of this coming up, actually. So parallel is not very realistic. 
uh, it does not give a realism, but it preserves the relative positions of objects. We see more objects in the positions of the objects. And the perspective projection gives us the realism view, but it does not preserve proportions. Like, I don't know how big her computer is. All I see is the tip of it. <laughs> so, I can't tell. I'm missing that information. I don't see it. And uh, if I were to scale the room, everything back there is getting smaller. Everything up here is bigger in terms of the proportion that we're looking at. So the further distance I get away, the objects become smaller in my viewpoint, uh, which would be a perspective because it's in perspective of the camera, of the location versus a parallel. Uh, so see projections of distance objects are smaller. Uh -huh. Then projections of objects of the same size that are closer to the view plane. It's actually kind of interesting. If you look at paintings, you sort of see it. So what are we looking at here? We have perspective versus parallel. So this is supposed to be more realistic. Objects behind are smaller, which means we can see more of them. But the scale is different. Here, everything is of the same proportion and we see them basically layered on top of each other as they're coming back. If I were a painting, I think this would be more of what I was going to try to achieve so I can see more detail. Here I have less detail. I don't know what's behind this chair. and I, I don't even see, because of the angle, I didn't even see the, de the depth of this. I'm only seeing as the parallel plane of the objects in terms of this back here is the same size as this up here. This back here is big, back here is small. <laughs> so you see this in paintings, actually. And uh, artists do this. They draw so you can see the long hallway, and you can see all the way down the hallway, and then that's a perspective. And then on and down the bottom, you see, you know, oh, look at that, it's a very, very small little teacup sitting on a table. Oh, okay. You can make that, so. <clears throat> and then when people draw it, they draw, you know, they draw it real small, because it's in the back. Versus, uh, you know, same size, strong parallel. So viewing coordinate system, and how does it relate to computer graphics? Well, it does, actually. <laughs> so viewing is easier if we work in a viewing coordinate system. So we have our object coordinate system, and we have our viewing coordinate system. And the way you can get this is this is the, okay, so both of these have object um, coordinate system. The teapot is on top of the chair. The chair is on top of the floor. The wall is behind, and we have actually we even there's a lot of detail in here. We have a shadow that's being cast. So, the object lighting is attached to the shadow. You can see the shadows are slightly different over here than it is over here from a slightly different shot from light source that's been moved. So we create the realism of the lighting by creating the certain type of light that we want, and we position the light angle to hit the objects in the object coordinate system. We also have the view coordinate system. These are two separate view coordinate systems. This one is coming from a slightly different angle than this one's coming from. This one's actually turned this way a little bit more to the right. The viewing angle is rotated to the right to the point where we can't see. We're looking at this wall over here. We don't see this entryway. The entryway is back here. It's probably up here somewhere, but we can't see it. <laughs> That's our view position which is different than our object position. So our object position is going to, and then, and this is probably the most confusing part because when people start looking at these things, they go, okay, view position, object position, rotation position. We can rotate the view that's unrelated to the, how the objects are rotated. We can rotate the objects unrelated to the view. We can add light, shading, color, contrast, and multiple different objects to this overlay have a person walk into this scene and move the lamp and sit on the chair, which is totally unrelated to the objects as well. So these are all like the subcomponents that make up the kind of realism that's associated with this. So our, now that we know what we're talking about, hopefully, <laughs> the viewing coordinate system, our angle of projection, it's easier to work with the viewing coordinate system where the observer or the camera position is on the z-axis looking along the negative z direction. You're over here and you're looking this way versus being on the Y. If you're on the Y, you're probably looking down on the scene. And then if you're on the X, depending upon how you're rotating the scene, how you've excuse me, translated the scene, you're looking at the side versus the head. This is going to give you head on. 
which is where we put the Z. We put this origin, we, we set the origin at zero, and then we set the camera position at Z for our normal, and our Z is going to be, you know, which, which angle are we projecting forward on, which is going to give us, we, the, you guys have a different Z position than I have. We both have, in an inverse, the same XY, because we're both sitting relatively, we're all sitting relatively in the same, I'm facing you, you're facing me, so we're inverse, but we still have, I still have the same um, backwards, but it's still the same orientation of the objects in the room. So the decision is, do we go this Z or that Z? <laughs> we switch the Z. So if you're looking, if you were looking at a picture, you'd be looking, if I were looking at a picture, you'd be looking at the back side of the picture. I mean, who wants to look at the back side of a picture? So depending upon your orientation, you're going to set the Z at the starting position for the head on the face view of the scene, which gives us this. Well, actually not. If we were to rotate around so that we were in parallel with, you know, actually this is, this is, this is, the, this would be a proper starting position um, for a Z, for, for a good, good starting. How you're going to, see, these are different Z locations as well because one of them is angled to the, you know, looks like we're going to, we're going to the right here. We've shifted it this way. So, all right. So uh, where the observer, the camera is on the Z axis. So we're looking at it from the Z axis, and we're looking along the negative Z direction. So we're coming into it instead of out of it. It's negative because if we were in the scene, we'd be starting at the zero, and we'd be inside of the scene looking outward, which we're not. So it's always going to be the opposite inverse to go into the negative. If that makes any sense. So we're looking into it. Facing the origin of the scene. So we always put the origin up front. This is how I, I kind of I kind of simplify it by saying put the origin up front. <laughs> which means go and look down the negative z-axis so you're facing the origin. Which is going to be a, a pretty good viewing position. Starting position. And we're just talking about the starting position. So are we in, then we have our view plane definition. So we assume the view plane is a perpendicular to the viewing direction. So perpendicular to the viewing direction, we have the view plane. So the view plane is positioned at the zero, zero origin with a Z to some sort of a view plane position. So we're setting our Z depending upon where we want to look at the zero, zero. So imagine this, you're looking at a picture on the wall, and the picture is at zero, zero in terms of the origin, and you're changing your Z so that Actually, if we all turned around and looked to the right here at that picture, we all have different Z's, but we're still at zero. That picture is still at the zero, zero coordinate system, but we all have different view planes. Every single person in this room has a different view plane, but we're all in different Z's. So that's our view plane. <laughs> all right, so long story short. And our view plane is the picture that's set in the original coordinate system. The, the picture doesn't change. We, we change. So when we rotate, we rotate the view plane. So it looks at from the left, from the right, up, down, which is how we're creating our rotation. So, uh, so let D is equal to um, this is between the camera and the plane. Okay. So perspective projection calculations, if we were to calculate it out, and we can look at it. There's tons of algorithms that actually do it for us, and it's the efficiency of the algorithms that's going to give us our real-time animation and our capabilities in terms of the graphic package that we're using. For us, we're just going to project, set a position. Actually, we don't even have to do that with VRML. If you're working with OpenGL, you'd have to set, set the viewing position, essentially. But we can. We can actually rotate the initial scene. So looking along the x-axis in this particular case, or we can define our view plane from our camera distance. Lucky for you, you don't have to do any of these calculations for this particular course. If you were taking the course I taught last time, <laughs> that's why people were afraid to take this course. So I have changed it, made it more for digital arts people versus computer science people. So no, cat, no math in this class, by the way. So. Which means I can kind of skip through some of this, but I don't want you to lose the concept, So, which is why we're looking at it. So. But I know you guys love to do matrix calculations, right? 
Actually, it's not too bad, but now you know there's programs that do it for you, like Math Labs and stuff. There's, in fact, uh, VRML will do it for you as well. You just apply a method on the object to translate it, and it and translate it by how much. You run a function call on it, essentially, and you say, translate the object. What does that mean? You'll add a particular offset to it, and then it rotates it for you instead of having to do it on your own. But you can actually specify this out. If you look at some of the examples online, you'll see that there are some matrix calculations being performed in it. And it's basically, here's a starting, here's an ending, bring me there, <laughs> kind of thing. So here's the transformation matrix for the perception. Slightly different than it is for the projection uh, perspective, perspective uh, mechanism here. So what's this note for later? The original Z coordinate of point is retained. It is actually, because you're moving the object in the original Z. So if we were to move, to create the transformation, that picture would have to move. You're not moving. If you're on the Z, you're staying the same. The picture would move. That gives us our 3D. Because, you know, wouldn't that be like the, what do they call it, like the poor man's 3D? You take the computer and you move it around. <laughs> or you move around next to the computer, which would be not really 3D graphics. So if the picture moved, then we'd have 3D. But that's 2D, actually, because we only see the XY coordinate of it. It doesn't rotate around the Z. It's 2D, which is kind of interesting because that's what we're looking at. Our computer screens are 2D. It's just like that picture on the wall. So we're mimicking 3D on a 2D display. That's what we're doing by providing the concept of the view plane. So. All right. So we need uh, what is this? We need relative depth in the scene in order to sort out which faces are visible to the camera. Yeah, actually, we do. So vanishing points. So okay. So in a perfect world, we wouldn't have to care about any of the stuff I'm going to talk about next because we can just do everything, and we don't care what we're looking at. It just gets processed, and it's there if we want to see it. Right, but it's not really a perfect world. We have processing, we have rendering, we have the scene to c calculate, and it's all done through algorithms, and it's all done through rendering processes. So we want to maximize it. So we have things like hidden hidden surface removals, we have vanishing points, we have different concepts to take into consideration so that we can draw the image out correctly, render it fast, and not include stuff we don't need. So when a 3D object is projected onto a view plane using a perspective parallel lines, and the object not parallel to the view plane coverage, uh, con uh, converge to a vanishing point. So we have a vanishing point, which is one point perspective here, projected up a cube. So the object is not parallel on the view plane, so which, which means it's using a perspective. We have a point which it vanishes to. It's like the um, car that drives away into the sunset. That's the vanishing point. At one point, we can see a dot. You know, that's the vanishing point in terms of the concept. It's going to reduce. Eventually, if we move the view far enough away from it, we're going to get the coordinate system where it ends up, which is a point. It's a location. One and two point perspective drawings. So we have one point perspective drawing here. And then we have two points. So we still have the same row. Is that the same row? No, the pictures are different. No, pictures are the same. This is this road over here. This is this road over here. And then we have the two point perspective. Which means we have a vanishing point. So this is one vanishing point for the road in terms of the object that we're looking at. So this is where art actually comes into place when people are looking at you know, the concept of the vanishing point. And we have to actually calculate this through an algorithm in computer graphics because we don't have the artistic. Computer graphics people are not artistic people. <laughs> if you were to draw this out, you could actually see it. But all the computer graphics concepts come from art concepts. So here's a one point perspective, and this is a Trinity with the Virgin, St. John's. Hmm. Said to be the first painting in perspective. Well, you can see the depth of the, well, I don't know, I'm not a very religious person, so don't quote me on this stuff, but what is this there, a hallway, <laughs> um, a thing? Uh, so inside, you can see the, eventually there's a vanishing point back here, it's black. So 
vanishing point of the scene. You can see a vanishing point of individual objects or a vanishing point of, scene, of the scene. So if you were to stretch it out, at one point we'd get uh, some perspective. And, but you can see this is in front of here. These guys are behind these guys. So it's definitely a perspective, a uh, one-point perspective. Here's a two-point perspective. Well, we have the perspective of the sky in the background. And we have the building, the lighthouse. So we have, uh, if you go to postershop.com, you can see the different perspectives uh, in terms of that, uh, in terms of the concept. So, looking at the different numbers of points that you're going to see from vanishing angles. So parallel projections, we have two types of parallel. So we, we know parallel and we know perspective. So in terms of the parallel, to take this to a little bit more detail, we can define two types. We have orthogonamic and we have oblique parallel. So orthographic, orthographic if I can say this word correctly, parallel. Uh, projection has a view plane perpendicular to the direction of the projection. So here's our view planes, and so this one is perpendicular to the direction of the, so it's up and down, perpendicular, not parallel, but perpendicular to the direction. So we only consider the orthographic projection. This one here, the oblique one, has a view plane as an oblique angle to the direction of the projection. So we would uh, be able to see through it which is not going to give us very much images. It's not going to give us um, the realism. So consider the orthographic projection. So parallel projection calculations is going to look similar to this. This is the same thing. It, it, again, you don't have to worry about the calculations for it. It's the same picture as we saw for, for the perspective, but now we're talking about the parallel projection. And the calculation that would exist for it. So. And it's an easier perspective, hmm. a little bit. So view volumes in the view window. So how do I describe view window? Well, we know view window. We know view window because we've seen we've all taken pictures probably. <laughs> the view window of your scene is the view window of your camera. You know, usually you see a box, and then maybe you see the plane, and then you see a dot in the middle. So this is the middle of the view window which means everything out of the view window is not going to show up in the view. Well, you have a view window that you can do in computer graphics to make the scene a certain size, which is the same thing that you get with cameras. So the type of lens in the camera is one factor which determines how much the view is going to be captured. So people put on the big, broad, wide-angle camera lenses, and they'll say, pick up more of a view window, or the view window has more uh, depth to it so you can see the sides. Um, or you can buy one of those cheap disposable cameras and you get this itsy bitsy little view window. Click a button, view window doesn't ever change, it just gives you whatever's exposed to into the view window at the time. So wide angle lenses captures more than the regular lens, obviously. Same concept applies. Um, actually we've seen it with film a lot, wide angle lens capture, which gives us more depth, takes up more memory, creates a bit creates a heavier file, bigger file, gives us more high definition, however, a little bit more expensive to process. Analogy in computer graphics is that the view window is a rectangular in the view plane. So we're just defining, and our view window may not necessarily be the same size as our view plane. Our view window can change. A classic example, going back to that picture with the girl in the house, what if she was looking out the window? <laughs> We'd want to narrow the view plane, the view window, excuse me. Well, the view plane would also change, but we would want to narrow the window so that you didn't see as much, make it smaller, then it makes it look like you're looking out of a window. If you went over to a window, created a computer graphic scene where you went to a window and you looked out the window, and the objects in the window were the same size, <laughs> and the window was the same size as the original window you were looking out of, then it's going to look fake to you. But if you look out the window and everything is a little bit smaller, and the window itself is smaller, 
the viewplane is now reduced down to a smaller window, then it looks realistic. So how many people look out, like a, look through a peephole? Actually, this classic example, you look through a peephole in a door. You guys know what those things are, you know? Knock on the door, who's there? You walk up to the door, where's the peephole? You look at the peephole and you, you see this round little thing of the person. <laughs> That's a narrowing window. So you can create that in computer graphics just by changing the window size. So you view, the view volumes go down lower. In fact, you make things smaller too. You can shrink the items in the window. In fact, those items in the windows are shrunk as well. So creates realism. Then we have the view volume, the front and the back planes. We have the front of the object, the back of the object, size of the object. So we also typically want to limit the view to the uh, direction, the Z direction that we're standing from. Because why would we want to see everything else? It's not going to be visible. It wouldn't look very realistic either if we saw the backs of it. If I saw the backs of everybody this, who's sitting in front of me right now, oh, I'd probably lose my head at that point. But realism, not so real. <laughs> so why do we need to render it? We don't render it. So we clip it. Uh, so we define two planes, each parallel to the view plane. To achieve this, we have front plane or near plane, and then we have back plane or far plane. So it's the back plane, the front plane, so we can rotate and we can kind of keep things in perspective and we can render as needed. View frustrum, which is a perspective projection. So we have the view frustrum, and this is just the, the word for it, probably saying it wrong. In terms of our pronouncing it, incorrectly, but in terms of our camera, we have our view window that gets bigger and bigger and bigger, which is kind of interesting, actually, because the farther we get away from the camera, the more we can actually see. <sighs> Again, it comes very obvious, obvious when you take your hand and you stick it in front of the lens and all you see is your hand. <laughs> but if you bring the hand back further, you can see more. Well, we can take and use that concept, which is what this is describing, actually, in computer graphics to make things look a little bit more realistic. We want the view gets bigger the farther we get away from the camera, which is uh, going to be our view frustrum. So the back plane is pretty big, and our view frustrum is huge compared to our window. So our view window is smaller in terms of our front plane. Our view volume in terms of a parallel projection, this is a per, this is a perspective perspective projection versus the parallel projection where things are in front of each other in the parallel plane, not so not so broad. So the back plane is about the same size as the front. Things look flatter, uh, which is not as realistic looking, actually. Uh, but uh, for certain animations, for certain videos, uh, certain calculations, it might actually make sense. So. so in terms of review volume, the front and the back planes act as important clipping planes. So we have back clipping, where are we? To clip it means to get rid of it. it, means to dispose of it, to clip it out. It's like uh, take a pair of scissors and clip the picture. For all of your X's that you don't want in the pictures, you just cut them out. So you can do that in computer graphics automatically. You apply a clipping algorithm to it, or you have VRML do it for you. So you can use this selected part of the screen you don't want to view and clip it out. So front plane is important to, in perspective to remove near objects, which will swap the picture. So This is where we ended last time. We already have gone through the VRLM introduction, so we have hit this part already. So we don't have to hit that again. Um, so let's see. The other part, which we probably should start for about a half hour on, I keep hearing noises, is it my computer? No. <laughs> is uh, number one, number one, which is uh, the second part, but I'm doing it in reverse order because the number two is not quite as, uh, so I'm going to go for another maybe a half hour here, 15, 20 minutes, so just going to the first couple of concepts here. This is part one of the part two, but I'm doing it in reverse order. So, in fact, I did part two in reverse order, too. This one's getting into some of the space issues. It's actually sort of a continuation with a little bit more technical detail, not as many concepts, which is why I started with the other one first. So modeling a simplified process of creating the 3D objects. Different processes to create the models. This is going to talk more about the algorithms and how these things I just mentioned are actually implemented in terms of the graphic packages. 
many different representations of the data model. All of them are pretty much trying to accomplish the same thing. So OpenGL does a really good job of implementing the basic concepts. And then the higher level APIs that are written on top of OpenGL make it easier for the programmer to automate and to quickly create definite shapes that are of uh, you know, common characteristics. If you want to basically change the concept of the shapes, then you're going to work with an OpenGL instead. Once models are obtained, you can transform them to the correct locations and the view space and the camera space, rendering them from a 2D image on the scene. So, so now we're looking at some more nitty-ditty details that are sort of the basic concepts uh, in terms of polygonal. Um, the uh, spatial subdivision techniques, probably I can't get into, I'm just going to cover polygonal right now, which is the first section in terms of model representation. Talked about polygons, which is why I thought this was a good thing to conclude with today. Complex objects are broken down into simple polygons. That's a bunch of polygons. So the fewer number of polygons, the less detail we see. The farther away the image is, the fewer number of polygons in the view, the fewer number of polygons that need to be rendered. So we can optimize the algorithms to create these images by looking at the, uh, the level of, uh, well, the distance between the viewpoint and the object itself, and then also um, the amount of uh, detail that we want to look at in terms of level of detail. So polygons form the skin of the object. Objects are hollow, which is kind of interesting because nothing in the real world is hollow, but we don't notice it. <laughs> polygons are this. Shapes are all hollow. Objects are hollow. Polygons have a front face and a back face to them. Uh, so, which means not only does this object have a front and a back, but this, all of these different little polygons that are in here have a front and a back face to them as well. So we can cave them in, we can push them out um, by changing the coordinate locations of each one of the polygons. So if we're looking at animation, the more polygons we have, the more movement. In fact, in this particular hand, the more realistic the, th the finger movement's going to be because we can rotate those little polygons around. And not only that, but we can show the skin a little bit more contrast. Um, Little finer detail. Triangles are the number one choice of polygons. Yes, they are always planar. And computer graphics is often optimized for triangles. So where this is where we're getting our NVIDIA. In fact, most most computers, I think Apple's using NVIDIA, but most computers are using NVIDIA drivers. Um, or excuse me, hardware, graphic hardware. Um, so I don't read too much into the numbers. There are similar processing numbers and speeds. Actually, everyone is pretty much doing the same right now in terms of processing. Because what we ended up doing is just adding more memory. The more memory we have, the more triangles that can be rendered, processed per second to give us the more complex images. So think of this sort of like dots per inch, I guess, or resolution. And that um, the more you have, the more information you're pushing through the pipeline, the longer it's going to take. And in the old days, there was a difference between the different cards in terms of how much, how many triangles could be painted per second. Now it's about the same for everything. Actually, retina displays right now actually can do much faster as well. But uh, you're looking at more details, what you're looking at in terms of that display. Triangulation, how many, tri how many triangles are obtained? Uh, so triangling a set of surface points, so several different triangle approaches. Um, in terms of putting them together, how you're going to draw them. You really, this becomes a lot. In fact, here's the no triangles and then we connect the dots to create them, which is getting us our triangulation concept. And um, this really becomes, um, I don't know, obvious to, to people when they start doing wireframing. So if you've ever experimented with wireframing, you know there's many different ways of drawing a triangle. Um, so, and are the triangles all gonna be the same, same kind of shape format? And then how are you going to subdivide? It's almost like uh, when people decide, how are we going to cut a pizza? Or how are we going to cut a pie? You're breaking it out into triangles. Well, how are you going to make all the triangles the same size? You know, is it going to be fair? Uh, well, you're going to have different size triangles for different sections of this hand, as an example, because we're going to want to show a little bit more detail in here. So if this was all one or two triangles, it wouldn't actually give us very much resolution. It wouldn't give us very much depth. It wouldn't give us very much uh, detail in the drawing. So there's a lot of theories in how to draw the triangles. 
So how many triangles are I going to do? Well, more triangles are needed in the surface. <coughs> the areas <coughs> that require more geometric detail require more triangles. Higher curvatures, more triangles are necessary because we need to be able to move, um, especially for shading. You think about the concept of lighting and shading and stuff. If you're going to draw tri polygons and do this kind of wireframing sort of technique, the more you have, uh, the more you're able to adjust coloring and the shading and things of that nature. Which comes in the concept of level of detail. It's going to be very costly to always display an entire object at the greatest level of detail. What does that mean? Taking this one and displaying it like this every time you're going to display it. The farther the item is from the viewplane, the less level of detail you need. Because you can't really see it. So you can reduce the level of detail given the viewing perspective and given the type of viewing that you're looking at. You can adjust the detail. If something is hidden in the background, no need to render it. In fact, some things just look like a blog, like a blah. In fact, you get that with cameras, too. You know, I can take and you can focus. Usually there's a button that says, you know, focus right here, and then everything else is kind of like out of focus. Not as much level of detail than at the center point where you've said, this is my level of detail, this is where I want to optimize, and then everything away from it, I don't care about. So things can be fuzzy, out of focus, things can be just not so good. But we don't care because we're looking more primarily concerned with the object that's in the view, in any view. So less detail is necessary the farther away you get from the object. Also depends on the viewing angles and the uh, screen size. The bigger the screen, the worse the image is going to look. <laughs> the smaller the screen, which is why you put, you know, with these mobile devices, it was perfect. In fact, you can take a real crappy quality movie, like a 320 by 240 resolution movie, DVD, and it looks flawless on its bitsy little display. <laughs> you take the same movie, you put it on a big screen, it's going to look terrible, if it even looks. It's probably going to be blurry, because it has a lower level of detail. What is that? What is the resolution? Reduced from, a, let's say, a 720 or 8-something or 9-something down to a 240. So you're lowering the level of detail, reducing the resolution, degrading the quality. But if the screen's small, you can't see it. So when you think of level of detail, always think smaller, lower level of detail. <laughs> which is great. Bigger, higher level of detail. Uh, which is interesting, because if you take an operating system that's designed for a retina display, well, you're going to have a different driver that's running, because... That's going to show you a bigger level of detail, but do you really need to show that level of detail on a non-retina display monitor? No. Well, they've adjusted it, so you're not going to see it in retina. So it's just good, because your graphics are going to run too slow. But actually, one of the interesting things, not to, not to keep talking about Apple, but one of the interesting things that happened with the Mountain Lion is it uses OpenGL for the graphic rendering. <laughs> so this newest version of Mountain Lion is using OpenGL, and it's using uh, optimized algorithms for the different displays, which is nice as well. So it's giving you the level of detail that's needed for your particular hardware, hopefully. So the solution here is create several different models of the object at different levels of detail, and then display the correct one for the viewing distance. And here's our level of details. We have 50 vertices, 500 vertices, or 2,000 vertices, which means we have more polygons. So if we put this guy farther away, we don't need this guy. <laughs> If we're going to put this guy in front of us, we're going to need this guy because we're going to need the level of detail. So we can create different models of different levels of details for different objects. Same object, just different levels of detail. And use whichever one you want in the scene to optimize the processing. So this is going to process faster than this one will. What do you mean by processing? All the information that's going through the rendering pipeline and all that stuff that's going through your graphics card to make it to your monitor, less stuff. Only 50 vertices versus 2,000 vertices. So, and here's an example. Here, this is the same guy, right? Big one, 2,000, 50. Way back here. Can't see him anyway. He's way back here. What's? Why do we need to make him 2,000? We don't. So, which is something we don't think about when we take camera pictures or movie pictures. This is this is totally computer graphics oriented. It's the same concept. But you have to make it happen yourself by lowering the number, number of polygons, by making it smaller. So it's a manual process. But you could easily take this guy and put him three times. Waste of, waste of image space, waste of data. So 
it's going to, this will load faster in a real-time system than uh, it would if it uses the same level of detail. So how to create the same model in multiple different levels of detail as an example. Start with the most detailed one and then resample with less vertices and then re-triangulate re it. You know, change the triangulation around a little bit and you'll get to a happy medium. Most of your graphics software will allow you to do that to adjust the triangulation. Uh, when to switch models when rendering? A good question. Based on the distance and the screen size. If the screen size is small enough, don't use the bigger ones. Use the smaller ones. So 640 by 480 screen, 307,200 pixels. Object takes up half of the screen, 150k pixels. So any more than 300k uh, triangulars, half of the facing away from the camera is overkill at that particular distance. So there's actually books that give you charts that give you the scaling to know that, you know, at this particular distance, this is the number of polygons you're going to want to use. In fact, most of your graphics software will allow you to arrange and take a usually it only goes from a large, le big level of detail to a smaller one it won't go the opposite direction because it's too much thinking so you can take an image and reduce it down it's just hard to go the opposite direction it's kind of like if you open up paint you know and you, how you make it it's nice to make an image smaller it works just great but if you make an image bigger it's blurry it just turns into crap after that so Visual artifacts can occur at switching points. Yes, they can. Blurriness, different problems that could happen. Um, you see this in, uh, sometimes you see it in video games when uh, it's actually, they switched it. They put in a different uh, resolution, a different image, and then the image was slightly different because they didn't modify it to match the original, and they changed the hair color or something, or they changed, they added something like a collar. And then you go, oh, look, the collar went away. What happened with that? Well, it's because they switched the image to put in a lower polygonal surface so they can render it faster. And then they forgot that the pictures don't match anymore because you're relying upon these guys being the same. <laughs> so if you give the guy some teeth and you don't change the rest of them and then you switch it, that's an artifact. Because uh, where did the teeth go? And how? Now it has teeth or something. So, Or you have blurriness or you have... Uh, fuzziness because it didn't actually locate at the same location. It went in. It, it's a smaller image. It's going to go in a slightly different coordinate system, so it's going to it's going to be jittery or it's going to fluster a little, depending upon the type of animation that you're performing. So, <coughs> oh, let's see. Creating the surface points triangulation works on a set of points. So one needs to create a surface point set. Many different approaches: manual placement, mathematical scanning real objects, mathematical generation, solids of revolution. We can rotate. In fact, you can see it working here um, for cross section around an axis where the the points are actually being filled in for spears, cones. So it's a model of a bunt cake. Generation of a surface that's going around. In fact, all it's doing is applying a mathematical rotation calculation to fill it in. So here's a colored version of the bunt cake, so, which is kind of an interesting object. So. so in terms of mathematical generation, we have the in, in ex, ex, uh, exclusion to ex, uh, extrude a cross section along a profile curve. So we take an original starting point, we move up, and then we curve it in at a certain level, a certain, de certain degree to get to a certain point. So many metals, plastic parts, cones, cylinders, bottles can be modeled this way. Essentially you're, what you're doing is creating the starting position and you're creating the height or you're putting in information, depending upon the package that you're creating to build the model, and you're building in a sequential fashion to actually populate the points and uh, you can actually do polygonal um, sketching. You can actually fill in the object with the polygons this way as well, depending upon the package that you're using. So it depends on how low or high level you're going with your APIs. Scanning, you can scan a real object, and this is the most popular thing these days. You scan a picture of an object. Well, I shouldn't say most popular. You scan a picture in, and then you allow the software to take the scanned image and create the outline of the image and do the point-to-point -point filling in. My problem is, is you're working kind of backwards. So with the concept here being that you're going to take the same identical scanned image and you're going to texture map it onto the wireframe that's created from it. 
and then you're going to use that wireframe to create the 3D animation, or 3D, versus this flat picture. Only problem is you've taken and you've applied a mathematical calculation you know, the computer has. And the uh, scanned image is a little slightly different than the original, so it doesn't fit on there correctly. It's not the identical, it's a computer representation of the scanned image that you've put in. So it's, if it's slightly bigger, slightly smaller, when you texture map, you can see the seams overlapping, and you can see imperfections in the mapping. Uh, so It works, though. So you have to tweak it, though. Like Actually, all of these techniques you pretty much have to tweak in order to get to work correctly. Computer vision, scanning and real objects, and here's the actual photography of the Hoover, ta Hoover Tower. Here's the recovered 3D model, and here's the model from a novel view of a texture mapping. So as I mentioned before, this doesn't really match this correctly. <laughs> um, you can kind of see the texture mapped, kind of, you know, it, it did an okay job. It's not a perfect replica, though. If it were, then we wouldn't be sitting here. We'd just press a button, and the computer program would just create all of our stuff for us, and we wouldn't have to look at any of these different techniques. So, uh, Did I miss anything? This is a, oh, this is the MRI one. Radar. Different ways of scanning as well. Um, actually, there's a lot of... Um, in the medical industry, I'm not familiar with it, but uh, there's a lot of scanning techniques where they're taking x-rays and they're taking MRI results and stuff, and they're archiving it, and then they're using it for database matches. So you can take that scanned image wireframe and take certain characteristics and then compare it across thousands of other similar images to see trends and stuff, uh, which is kind of interesting. But that's an entirely different concept. <coughs> triangle representations. So graphic cards do most of the triangular work. Yes, they do. And they need for efficient ways to send triangles to the card. Well, it's all algorithm approached or implemented. So some of the typical primitive triangle representations here, we have list, fans, and stripes. So, stripes, uh, strips, yeah, to strip. <laughs> or we can take one triangle, two triangles, put them together, and then duplicate the particular pattern. So here's a triangle fan where we're starting at one point, we're just putting one next to the other. A strip would be kind of a, a sequence that we're repeating over and over and over again. Or then we have the, the list itself where we just put them in, different, different shape triangles. The more different shapes we have and the more patterns that are associated with the real object, the more realistic. I'm sure we've all seen the, the boxy kind of, uh, you know, especially on a rounded surface with fewer number of triangles how the surfaces actually sort of look flat, but they're not. They're supposed to be rounded. Well, because the triangles were placed in sort of like in a pattern. Actually, you can see this in uh, furniture. You can see this in the carpeting. You know, when, when you see certain pattern, wood, actually wood's an, an interesting thing. When you, you can tell fake wood from real wood because of the repeating patterns. <laughs> Where you look at that and you go, well, that's fake. Well, it looks fake. It might be real wood, but the way it's laid down, the wood's too consistent. So if your triangles are too consistent, your object's going to look fake as well, uh, which is kind of the same concept. Because your level of detail isn't going to be there. It's not going to look real. So you can easily make wood look fake, actually, <laughs> by using the same pieces, which is why they give you, okay, so anyone who's ever laid wood flooring, I've never done it, but I've seen it done. You want to get flooring that has different sized boards. <laughs> All the boards are the same size, like triangles are the same size, and they're all put in the same pattern all together, and they all match. Your wood's going to look fake. So you want varying different sizes, and you know some of them have knots in it, some of them are lighter, some of them are darker. <laughs> same concept with triangles. So these are the techniques to draw them, and how you're going to draw them. You can draw them one at a time, two at a time, three at a time, put them in a strip kind of thing. So. In terms of the uh, adding a level of indirection with an index triangle representation. So store the vertices in a vertice buffer independently uh, of the rendering order, which is stored in the index buffer. Enable one to reuse the vertices multiple times without sending three coordinates each time. So this is a way that the computer can optimize the rendering of these triangles, so storing them up pre-calculating how they're going to be displayed, and then filling it in. So it's like, how are we going to process this information? Well, it's all the same. It's all triangles. So we're going to stack them up 
buffer them, and then paint it, and then reuse it over and over again. So conventional wisdom is that the index triangle strips are the most efficient. Well, that's because here's the strip here, because we've already pre-calculated all of the individual ones, so we don't have to lay them in a fan. So the strip is going to be like a, it's, um, maybe you ever go into the paint programs and you can see you can change the size of the brush, that's a strip. Or you can say, you know, you put a little box here, box here, those are strips. <laughs> so we paint the strips with the triangle coordinates for a particular surface that we're trying to paint for a graphics card. And uh, here's our surface normal, as I was mentioning before. We have this concept called the normal. Uh, the proper name is surface normal. So each triangle has a single surface normal to it. Easy way to define the orientation of the surface. Again, the normal is just a vector, no position. It's no position. It's like our, scene nor our normal scene um, in terms of our opening, and that's just going to be the starting position. It has absolutely nothing to do with... Uh, a position coordinate system. It's more along the lines of just the open face. So it's the surface normal in terms of polygons. So. And uh, computing the surface normal, you don't really need to know this for this course, but there's a way of computing it. So it is often normalized. Uh, well, we have to normalize the surface, the same thing that we would normalize in terms of the scene coordinate system. So the order of the vertices becomes important. Triangle A, B, and C has an outward facing normal. Triangle A, C, and B has an inward facing normal. It's going to be what we're calling our surface in terms of our outer surface is what we're going to paint and refer to a surface normal. So, which is just terminology. So, In terms of painting uh, triangles, this is going to be controlled by the graphics card. This is going to be controlled by the software that you're using in the program that's being used with the graphics card, I should say. And it has something to do with the efficiency, how to make it work properly. In terms of the surface normal, this is what you're going to define when you start painting, if you paint at this level. If you're using OpenGL, you can do this. If you're using VRL, VRML, you're just going to give, give me a rectangle, give me a cone, give me a sphere, and all that stuff's going to be given for you automatically. So. That is what we needed to cover for today. So I'm not going to... I'll finish this lecture uh, next week. And uh, since we... Uh, start getting through a little bit more, maybe even as far as next week, then we can start seeing all these concepts put into VRML, and then we have something we can build and something we can talk about in terms of practice. All right, that's all for today. Uh, thank you, and I will see you next week. I know we...